Hi, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel on UCTV, and it's my pleasure today to be speaking with uh, Dr. Ramachandran, Vilanyar Ramachandran, who is professor of psychology at UCSD and who's director of the Center for Brain and Cognition, also at UCSD. He's a remarkable person with a remarkable intellect and a remarkable set of insights about how the brain works. And so I thought to introduce him, I talk a little bit about what other people have said about him and then what he said about the brain. Uh, from Richard Dawkins uh, comes the quote, Ramachandran is a Latter-day Marco Polo journeying the Silk Road of science to strange and exotic cathays of the mind. From Mike Mersnick, uh, Ramachandran is a scientist with the kind of creativity that's really quite rare. Uh, it's usually not allowed in some sense. You're not supposed to be a butterfly like Ramachandran. Uh, my colleague describes his approach to science as opportunistic. In quotes, you come across something strange, what Thomas Kuhn, the famous historian and philosopher of science, called anomalies. Something seems weird, doesn't fit the big picture of science. People just ignore it. it. Doesn't make any sense. They say the patient is crazy if it's about a patient. A lot of what I've done is to rescue these phenomena from oblivion. Dr. Ramachandran is quite a remarkable person. Again, a remarkable intellect. He's the publisher of hundreds of papers and the literature of terrific books, The Telltale Brain, Phantoms in the Brain, A Brief Tour of Human Consciousness. And I wanted to use one of his quotes because I think it, it summarizes in a wonderful way. This is from The Telltale Brain. How can a three pound mass of jelly that you can hold in your palm imagine angels, contemplate the meaning of infinity, and even question its own place in the cosmos? Especially awe-inspiring is the fact that any single brain, including yours, is made up of atoms that were forged in the hearts of countless far-flung stars billions of years ago. These particles drifted for eons and light years until gravity and change brought them together here now. These atoms now form a conglomerate, your brain, that can only po not only ponder the very stars that gave it birth, but also think about its own ability to think and wonder about its own ability to wonder. With the arrival of humans, it has been said, the universe has suddenly become conscious of itself. Thus, truly, it is the greatest mystery of all. The brain. Welcome to the Brain Channel. It's a great pleasure to have you here. I've known you for a number of years. I've always been so pleased at your remarkable uh, ability to turn things on their heads. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and what your current interests are in brain science. Well, my interest in brain science, as you pointed out in that paragraph, and you quote, very kindly quoted, uh, arises from the big questions that everyone begins with as medical students. Well, what is consciousness? What is self-awareness? What is body image and things of that nature? But in science, very often, you can't directly head on tackle the big questions, like what is consciousness? Too nebulous a topic. But we can approach it chip away at the problem, uh, doing experiments, which is my approach, looking at odd phenomena which have been discarded or ignored for a long time. This is not new to neuroscience, it's an old tradition in science in general, like continental drift was ignored for a long time, till its significance was discovered. Bacterial transformation is another example. Even x-rays, discovery of x when it was first discovered, it was considered an oddity. And Röntgen published it in a newspaper first before sending it to a scientific journal because he was worried that it might get rejected but turned out to turn physics topsy-turvy when he discovered it. So in, neurology is full of these oddities and anomalies, and this is what we tend to focus on, not because they're oddities, but because they might illuminate something important or interesting about normal brain function. And uh, a lot of the time it's a wild goose chase, but every now and then you hit the jackpot. You know, one of the, one of the comments that you make is uh, <clears throat> that these anomalies are first easily rejected. Um, it just isn't true. What the patient says can't be true. The patient's crazy. And 
I think it probably would be your perspective that no patient is crazy, at least not crazy about phenomena that otherwise a sentient, thoughtful, uh, reasonable person is commenting upon. Their brain is, a, is generating images, perhaps even hallucinations, that for them are very real and that have all of them a basis in brain function. Right, absolutely. A lot of the time when you think the patient's crazy, it means you're not smart enough to figure it out. Right. You also look for consistency across patients who have not talked to each other. They produce the same bizarre story. Chances of this being them being crazy is quite small. An example of this would be a curious disorder we've studied recently with my colleague Paul McGeer, who's a postdoctoral fellow, who's now in Edinburgh. Uh, he and I looked at a phenomenon called apotemnophilia or xenomelia. 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 Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It refers to a person, I don't want to call him a patient because they don't regard themselves as patients. An otherwise normal person who leads a normal life in society, holds a job, has a family, perfectly fluent in conversation, not mentally disturbed in any way, often mildly depressed in some mm -hmm. ways. But the person is otherwise quite normal, but has harbored a secret desire all his life, or her life, her entire life, to have his arm or leg removed, amputated. Now just think about how absurd this sounds to one of us quote-unquote normal people. Right. And here's a perfectly, I saw a dean of a medical school not long ago who wanted his arm removed soon after he retired. And it's first time, first time he came out, so to speak. He was so embarrassed about it. So xenomelia is the condition in which a, a person believes that it would be appropriate, really desires for one of their limbs to be amputated. That is correct. And there are all kinds of vague Freudian theories about why this happens. There are chat groups among patients, people who have this condition. And uh, one, one standard view is that it's a cry for attention. Hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Why not remove the ear or nose or something innocuous? Why an arm? And often, more often, it's more often on the left side than on the right side. Why the laterality? And also, they'll take a felt pen and they'll draw an exact, precise line along which they want the amputation. Hmm. They'll draw an irregular line just below the elbow or just above the elbow. It varies from patient to patient. Yes. And you take a photograph and, and then do a surprise retest. A month later, you call him again and ask him to come to the lab. You haven't told him ahead of time you're going to bring him back. Ask him to draw the line. He'll draw the precise same line, irregular line, already hinting at the fact that this is not some sort of uh, cry for help or some vague psychological propensity to get rid of the arm. It may have a physiological basis. Otherwise, why should the precise line matter? So we, our first idea was that maybe... It turns out there's a complete map of the body surface and the surface of the brain, the postcentral gyrus. There's a big vertical furrow in the side of the brain. Mm. It's called the central sulcus. Right. Behind the central sulcus is a vertical strip of cortex. Mm -hmm. and on that vertical strip of cortex is a complete map, point to point, the surface of the body and the surface of the brain. So we thought maybe in these people, congenitally, the arm is missing. Mm. And the brain is hardwired to have a missing arm. Therefore, the arm feels strange or alien and they want it removed. It's kind of it's also as if it what, doesn't belong to them. It doesn't belong to them. Yes. So we went and looked at that area of the brain, and it seemed completely normal, disproving our theory. But then we went further up in the brain, and this region represents what we call the body image. We all have a sense of, you close your eyes, you have a vivid sense of all your body parts, moving body parts, and you open your eyes, there's confirmation of your body part. So there's a convergence of visual, somatosensory, auditory, all these inputs in the superior parietal lobule of the right hemisphere to construct what we call a body image, a dynamic, vibrant image of your own body. In that, in, that, in that region of the brain. Now that region of the brain was missing the arm. Mm. We showed this using imaging techniques. So the information from the arm, from the hand on the arm, skin, bones, and muscles, goes up to the, the postcentral gyrus, the first map, but there's nowhere for it to get to in the second map, the body image map. So there's this clash. They expect the signals arrive, but there's nowhere for it to, arrive, to get to. So the discrepancy is picked up by a structure called the amygdala in the brain. And then it create, makes you uncomfortable. So the lack of connectivity between <clears throat> the primary sensory station and where that information uh, becomes organized into a body image, that's th the connection is missing for this part of the limb that one wishes to amputate. That's correct. And so they regard it as foreign. They regard it as not them. Well, if you ask them, they're very specific about it. They say it doesn't feel like it's foreign, but it feels like it's too intrusive. It's too much a part of them. Ah, I see. Okay. Which is very consistent across subjects. And then they say they want it removed, and about half of them go get it removed. Half see, of it, them? It's hmm. illegal in this country, but they go across the border and get it removed, half of them. And then when they get it removed, 90% of them feel very good about it. The depression lifts. Huh. They feel finally they're, they're a complete person. 
So here's an example of a, of a very strange, odd, quote unquote, disorder, spooky even, which you think is psychiatric, but it turns out, in fact, there's a simple neurological explanation you can come up with. You come up with a theory, test your theory, and then do brain imaging if required, and show that you're on the right track. And these are your tools. The tools that you're using begin with the individual person. Let's not call them patient. Right. Begin with the person, collect the kind of information that would seem reasonable for their complaint, and presumably do some kind of an examination to kind of confirm that, yes, they do feel. You can touch the, the, the limb and there is sensation there. Right. It's just that that sensation doesn't get organized in a way, in this case, that's normal. So that's the neurological method, of course. That's right. There's it's very old fashioned. It could have been done 100 that. years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Now, in reading the, the papers and, and reading uh, what you've spoken about, it seems that misrepresentation of, of a physical reality that all of us would appreciate is, in essence, the underlying substrate for a lot of the problems that. Uh, that, that, that you've looked at for a lot of the, not the problems, a lot of the issues that you've looked at. Especially when it concerns body image, that's mm -hmm. true. For example, we've studied a phenomenon called RSD, mm -hmm. reflex sympathetic dystrophy. The name sounds strange, but what, what happens is you typically have a small injury in your finger. Let's say you touch a hot kettle or a flame, you withdraw your hand, ouch. It's a protective reflex to avoid further tissue injury. Why didn't, why, why didn't your brain by natural selection? But sometimes the opposite happens is there's a more permanent injury, like a meta metacarpal bone fracture, a uh, more severe damage, I should say. What happens, they're nonetheless quite, quite trivial. What happens is the finger, instead of being removing your finger, it gets immobilized, or quote unquote, temporarily paralyzed. This immobilization reflex is again to allow the tissue to heal. So it's also adaptive, even though the pain is similar, the adaptive function is different and the manifestation is different. Here the arm is temporarily quote unquote, paralyzed. But then the bone heals, and after a few weeks, the injury heals, the inflammation subsides, the swelling subsides, the redness subsides, the pain subsides, and then you start moving the finger again. That's a normal sequence of events, full, full, full recovery. But in a certain percentage of patients, maybe about 2 or 3%, this doesn't happen. The pain persists with a vengeance, the inflammation does not subside, the finger swelling does not subside. In fact, it spreads to the entire hand from the finger, entire arm from the finger, the arm gets swollen, becomes hairless, bone starts atrophying and sweating changes and all the signs of inflammation are amplified. So a tiny little injury that would normally be handled perfectly well now basically takes over the whole limb. Takes over the whole limb. And it's been inc considered incurable largely, although there's some sympathetic involvement and sympathetic ganglionectomy sometimes helps, but notoriously ineffective. We hit on the technique of using a mirror because our hypothesis was this is a form of what we call learned pain inspired by our earlier work on phantom limbs. That is, every time the patient tries to move his finger, he gets an ouch signal from vision saying, ouch, it hurts, ouch. So the, the, there's a heavy link, a memory link be established between the mere command to move the hand and the pain signal coming from back from the hand. So the pa patient just gives up and refuses to move the hand. So it's immobilized by pain. So we then put a mirror and then asked, as you say, the experiments were, were based on previous experiments we had done on mirrors using phantom pain mm -hmm. to cure up phantom pain. So, and then you move the normal hand, then you see the abnormal hand, you see the reflection of the normal hand in the mirror, superimposed on where the paralyzed hand is. But now, the, when you move the normal hand, it looks like the paralyzed hand is moving. It's an illusion, optical trick, without any pain. Mm -hmm. so, you, so the brain is told, you can look, look, buddy, you're able to move your hand, your quote unquote paralyzed hand, fine, and it's not painful. So you unlearn this learned association. So this is based on a handful of patients initially by Patrick Wall and his colleagues. Mm -hmm. And now there's been a whole uh, uh, double-blind control, placebo-controlled study on 50 patients in Europe showing that the 20 patients who were on the mirror, all of them without exception, the pain fell down from a scale of, eight, from evaluation of eight on a scale of 10, excruciating pain, to barely noticeable pain, down to about two, in all, all 20 patients. It's about as good as, as it gets in pain research. Mm. And the placebo control was just an opaque mirror, and the third control was visual imagery. And in fact, some of them increased the pain, because mm. the patient was paying more attention to the pain. But as a mirror produced a dramatic reduction. But then they did a crossover, one's on imagery and one on, one's on the opaque mirror. Again, the pain got reduced to about two. 
So, so now it's widely used in, in clinics. Wonderful, and it's a huge problem. So, so the idea that is that you're providing the brain information that it otherwise wouldn't have. That's correct. It interprets movement as no longer necessarily painful. In fact, it's not painful. That's correct. And so, in a way, you're reprogram. The idea is you're reprogramming brain circuits to allow the normal function to continue on the injured side. That's correct. And even more amazing is when Patrick Wall and uh, Blake and others, Candy McCabe and others, first studied this. One of the things they noticed is that the atrophic, dystrophic arm, the painful, dystrophic, inflamed arm, the actual temperature changed online as they were watching the mirror. Ah. The temperature changed and the swelling subsided as they were watching. So this is about as good as an, exam an example of mind-body medicine as it gets, where your skin, temperature, which you cannot fake, you can fake pain, it can be placebo and all that, even though they did all the, did all the controls with the mm -hmm. opaque mirror. You can't fake a temperature change in a finger. So exactly what the pathways are that mediate this remain obscure. But it's fascinating to me to see that, that happen. But there's no magic. There's no there's magic no in the not. mirror. No, the no. mirror is providing your brain an alternative source of information that allows it to function more normally. And presumably for those circuits that are meant to work in the brain, to work normally as they have it maybe for months at that point in time. That's correct. Yeah, very cool. Um, and the phantom limb, pain, maybe we'll talk a little bit about phantom limbs and phantom limb pain sure. and the use of mirrors in that context. Sure. When an arm is removed, a patient often continues to vividly feel the presence of the missing arm. This is called a phantom limb, as everybody knows. Now, in about half the patients, the phantom is immobilized, frozen in a particular position. In many of them, they can move the phantom freely and it's less painful, but the ones in whom the phantom is immobilized often say the phantom hand is excruciatingly painful. And they can't do anything about it. There's a painful itch, they can't scratch a phantom limb. There's a painful cramp, they can't massage the phantom. Mm. So this is very frustrating and a serious clinical problem. But half the patients with phantom, limb phantom limbs experience phantom pain. Mm. Excruciating pain, sometimes driving them to de severe depression, even suicide. Yes. So there have been various pharmacological approaches. Some of them are quite effective, but usually not, not, not very effective. So again, we hit on the technique of using a mirror so let's assume my, I'm the patient with the phantom limb, and uh, I put my phantom limb on the left side, it's cramped in an awkward position and it's painful, mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. or like that. Mm -hmm. Then you ask him to try and move his hand, the patient says, I wish I could move the hand, but I can't, mm -hmm. it's stuck. And you do the same thing as you did with RSD, you put the normal hand on the other side of the mirror, you peek inside the mirror, then you see the position, you see the mirror reflection of the normal hand superposed on the felt location of the phantom. Mm -hmm. So it's as though you optically resurrected his phantom. He's yeah. looking at his phantom limb for the first time in five years or 10 years or three years or one year, or however long ago the amputation was done. And then you ask him to send mirror symmetric commands to both hands, like move, move horizontally or clench and unclench a fist or clap or wave goodbye while looking in the mirror. Mm. So he's going, to, he's going to close that loop, sensory motor loop. He's going to get the visual illusion that the phantom is obeying his command. The fist is opening. Right? Mm -hmm. So this guy has a clenched phantom fist for the last year, exclusively in a painful position. He can't open it. The visual feedback of the hand opening suddenly kicks in and he actually starts opening his phantom. Mm. When he opens it, the painful cramp is relieved. And this again has been, has been confirmed in clinical trials by Tsao and his colleagues in, uh, in uh, Walter Reed. Right. It's used widely. Uh, again, the surprising effect of visual feedback mm -hmm. in, in correcting you know, one question, I, I'm a right-hander. <clears throat> I write right-handed. I wonder if I could learn to write left-handed using the mirror. That's a good question. Uh, I think you can, you can do so even without using the mirror, but it's slow and tedious. But with the mirror, I suppose you, you could accelerate it. And the great neurologist, Brown Sequard, huh. French neurologist in the 19th right. century, actually tried this. Uh, he didn't use a mirror, but he just tried educating people to use the left hand to write, yes. claiming that those people who suffered a stroke would now be, be more, more, more able to cope right. with the disability yes. than people who have not been so trained. Right. He, he was arguing that if you train the left, uh, right hand, left hand to right, some of the other cognitive abilities will also transfer uh -huh. to the right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So maybe even language, sparing them of this. I don't know how far they, he got with that. But the, but the notion then that you have <clears throat> brain circuits that are incredibly flexible at some level, that with training or without proper use, change in ways that are 
either helpful or unhelpful is kind of the bottom line. The brain, the dynamics of brain circuit biology are terribly exciting and also right now mechanistically much to learn about them. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I wanted to turn to a recent paper that I thought was just uh, really, really interesting. And, uh, and part of it's just because it's odd. Sleep paralysis and the bedroom intruder. Ah, okay. Okay, so this is a paper that came out in 2014 with you as a senior author, and the first author is Balan Jalal. Um, so I'll just mention a couple things very quickly. So sleep, during sleep paralysis, the sleeper experience, and this is not uncommon, for our listeners, during sleep paralysis, the sleeper experiences a transient period of gross motor paralysis. While the sensory system is clear and the eyes and resp respiratory movements are completely intact. Um, during sleep paralysis, the intrusion of uh, rapid eye movement related mentation into emerging wakefulness is common. In effect, dreaming with one's eyes open. Now, these hallucinations occur in all sensory modalities and commonly involve seeing, hearing, and sensing the presence of menacing intruders in one's bedroom. This is very strange, <laughs> but, but it's common. Not so common, but pretty common. The intruder is often perceived as a shadowy humanoid figure. The figure may approach the sleeper's body, sit on the bed, strangle and even sexually assault the sleeper. Supernatural accounts of this hallucinate, hallucinated intruder are common across cultures and include nocturnal, incubus, succubus, assaults, old hag attacks, ghost visitations, and alien abductions. So for those who have been abducted by aliens, there's hope. Dr. Ramachandran has ways of thinking about that, can help us all to understand you. Talk, us, talk to us about the intruder, the intruder uh, when one is waking up. Well, ordinarily you get sensory feedback from the arms and legs anchoring your body. I, I can temporarily adopt an allocentric view of myself saying, I'm pretending I'm giving a lecture, I'm rehearsing a forthcoming lecture and I'm walking on the podium. But you temporarily entertain this thought, but you don't literally float out of your body. Right. You're anchored in your body. Egocentric. You're egocentric. You're egocentric. Yeah. But during sleep paralysis, there's a temporary escape from this egocentric feedback information that gives you, gives you this egocentric perspective. And you then imagine you literally start floating out of your body, you have an outer body experience. Undoubtedly, not just all these abduction cases, even concepts of soul, mm. yeah, ancient concept of soul could, have, could, could be derived, given, given how common this phenomenon is, sure. could be partly derived from such experiences. But we don't talk about it much. Because if we talked about it, <clears throat> people would say, we're crazy. Absolutely. <laughs> but we're not. Let me talk a little bit about allocentric versus egocentric. Let's define the terms. In an in egocentric mode, I see myself, if not the center of the universe, at least to which much information is being relayed and referenced. I'm, I'm in the center of the circle. Allocentric is I'm looking out. There are, other, there are many other centers, and I happen to be observing them. It's a reasonable first level you definition. You adopt another person's perspective. Right, and I'm going to go with that. Allocentric, for me, and for, in your words, allows one, an allocentric perspective, allows one to put one's, uh, to stand in the other guy's shoes, to understand what that person might be experiencing. Now, here I refer to the social conquest of Earth by E.O. Wilson, who argues that the allocentric perspective was essential for evolution, that understanding the others around the, uh, <clears throat> the Iron Age or the pre-Iron Age campfire allowed one to understand what the issues were that one needed to deal with to successfully move the tribe forward. Right, that, that's absolutely right. Being, being able to have a sophisticated theory of other people's intentions and minds, even for something as simple as imitation, imitation learning. So a polar bear, for example, has, uh, takes a few hundred thousand years to evolve a coat through natural selection. But a human baby or human infant watching his mother or father slay a polar bear and skin it and wear the coat does it in just one trial mm. or just half a dozen trials. 
So you skip 100,000 years of evolution by one trial of imitation learning. This obviously requires the child to put itself in the parent's shoes to adopt that parent's point of view in the hunt and subsequent skinning of the bear. This is thought to be mediated by a group of neurons called mirror neurons, but given the still a little bit preliminary, we won't go into that too much. But nevertheless, it's this skill set that humans have, and very likely other primates and very likely other animals, that <clears throat> allows them to take this other, other than my own perspective as a uh, way... to transcend. Uh, yeah, as a way of uh, helping to organize the group, helping to ensure that your own agenda is ultimately reflected in the group's activities. It's very pro evolutionary. It's very pro sending on your DNA to the next generation. Absolutely, yeah. And it's in the brain. You phrased it well. I think that that's right. Good. You've had a, such a terrific career and continues to have, you continue to have a wonderful, what are, what are the projects you're working on right now? What are we going to learn about uh, V.S. Ramachandran's next adventure and when are we going to learn about it? Well, we became interested in a condition called synesthesia, mm. originally described by Francis Galton in the 19th century, that certain people who are otherwise completely normal in the population have a following quirk. Every time they see a number, they see it tinges a particular color. So I draw the number five on a sheet of paper. It's red. Six looks green. Seven looks chartreuse. Eight looks indigo. Nine looks yellow, and so on and so forth. It's different for different synesthetes. Now, why does this happen? Again, it's an example of an anomaly or a quirk. Of course, they're not patients. They're just or found in the normal population. And um, it runs in families, so Galton said it may have a genetic basis. Mm. And also it's about eight or nine times more common among artists, poets, and novelists, mm. and creative people. Mm -hmm. It's controversial, but we think it's true. So why would that be? So first thing to show is these people are not crazy. One view is they're just making it up. Why would somebody make up something like that? Five is red and six is green. But leaving that aside, we needed proof. So we created a display. First of all, we found it's much more common than Galton thought. Not one in a thousand, one in a few hundred, it's one in 50 people have synesthesia. So there are two or three in my class, hmm. which I teach, a large undergraduate class. Wonderful, yeah. So we brought them in, and we had a matrix of fives. So they saw two as red and five as green. So you have a bunch of two, two fives scattered on the screen. And among, among them, there's a two or two, one or two twos. Now most of us have great difficulty in finding the twos camouflaged by the fives. Hmm. But these people spot it very, very quickly, much more quickly than you and I, because they see these red twos pop out against background of green fives. Mm. If they're crazy, how come they're better at it than us? Mm. This shows that it's an authentic, genuine phenomenon, sensory phenomenon. Because they tell you it's phenomenologically, they say, I see red color mm. against the background of green, green leaves, green fives. This shows that it's sensory, mm -hmm. it's automatic, mm -hmm. it's authentic, they're not making it up. Right. Question is, why does it happen? So we did some brain imaging studies, and what we found was that if you go to the fusiform gyrus of the brain, tucked away in the medial temporal lobes and the sides of the brain, there is a structure called the fusiform gyrus. In the fusiform gyrus, there's a color area of the brain where the sensory signals from color are processed. Mm -hmm. And right next to the color area is the number area where the visual appearance of numbers is processed. So we said this can't be a coincidence. Maybe there's some sloppy wiring in these people between the number area and color area, which are ordinarily clearly segregated in all of us. But in these people, there's some cross wiring, accidental cross wiring. The clue comes from Galton's own observation that it runs in families. Maybe there's a gene mm -hmm. that causes cross-wiring, because normally in the infant brain or in the fetal brain, everything is connected to everything. There's a tremendous redundancy of connections. These get pruned by pruning genes, and if these genes mutate, you get defective pruning between adjacent brain modules. So the number and color area, which is ordinarily segregated, get connected by these redundant connections. So every time you see a number, it activates not just a number neuron, but cross activates a color neuron and you see a corresponding color. This is the theory and we tested this using brain imaging and found this to be true. But then the question arises, why, why is it more common among creative people, among artists, poets, and all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is just a hunch, we haven't tested this, but it may be that when you, talk, when you speak about somebody who's artistically creative or poetic, what do you mean? You mean he's capable of analogy and metaphor. Mm -hmm. Like when Shakespeare said, it is, a Juli it is the East and Juliet is the sun. You don't say Juliet is a sun, does that mean she's a glowing ball of fire? Mm. Yeah, just, what does that mean? Uh, if you're schizophrenic, you might say that, but, uh, but what we usually mean is that she's warm like the sun, radiant like the sun, nurturing like the sun, so on and so forth. So it's a metaphor, right? Metaphors involve linking seemingly unrelated concepts and ideas which are located in far-flung regions of the brain. So if the synesthesia gene expressed only in the fusiform gyrus because of transcription factors, you get this quirk called synesthesia. The five is red and six is blue, which is completely useless. 
But if you express more diffusely throughout the brain, you're going to get hyperconnectivity throughout the brain, increasing the propensity to link seemingly unrelated ideas located in different parts of the brain, hence the propensity towards metaphorical thinking and creativity and artistic talent and literary talent. Mm. We said that's the hidden agenda of the gene. That's why it's still so prevalent. Mm. Why would one in 50 people see five as red and six as green? Not because of that, but because it has a hidden agenda, namely it makes some outliers in the population right. more creative, more, more poetic, creative. and all that. So here is an example of how you start with this quirk, synesthesia, known for 100 years, show that it's a real phenomenon, not, not some bogus phenomenon, not something that's fabricated by the patient, or the subject. Find out what the neural underpinnings are in the fusiform gyrus, and then point out its broader implications for understanding human nature, elusive aspects of human nature like creativity. This has led us now to asking questions about Savant syndrome. That's one the only thing we're interested in working on. We haven't started yet. Mm. But people have extraordinary ability to, for example, name four-digit prime numbers. Right. And the uh, question is, why does it happen? We're still, still up in the air. What about the genetic basis, then, of the synesthesia? Are you looking for genes? Well, people in Rockefeller were looking for genes. I don't know if, how far they've got with it. It's a re quite recent enterprise. Yeah. But one would expect we find a large enough family, you should be able to find the gene. Fascinating work. Fascinating life. Fascinating person. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Bill. And it's Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and UCTV. I hope you'll uh, continue to tune in and hear uh, not uh, just uh, this episode again, if it, uh, if it uh, makes sense to you, but also to listen to past episodes and continue to uh, check us out because there'll be additional terrific guests just like my colleague here in the future. Thanks very much for being with us.